Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. It's Demetrius here again from Obi Pixel. Today, once again, I'll take you through this little mini course we have in photography. This is for beginners, of course, and we'll be taking a look at the second video, the second topic, which will be digital photography versus film photography and the different pros and cons that we've had. So <clears throat> this will explore the ongoing sort of debate between digital and film photography and examining the evolution of how uh, from film we've gone to digital cameras and then what's the advantages of a film and then the remaining sort of strengths of film and where film is really superior. Now we can discuss some of the early days in terms of digital photography and I'll take you into some of the improvements that we see today and of course resolutions, comparisons and the importance sort of why it's actually very important for you to actually print photography because that's when you truly see what's really good in your photographs. So let me take you into this little presentation I've got for you. Uh, very short this time, it's not as long as the previous video, but I just want to break you into uh, some of the differences between the two if you're not familiar with film photography and um, just give you a little bit of insight. Hopefully this will help some of the beginners understand kind of the progression that we've gone through. All right, so I'll take you into this. This little presentation, by the way, you can download this anytime you want for free. I don't ask for any credit details. I don't ask for contact information, email addresses, none of that. You just click the hyperlink in the description in the video and just download the PDF. So let's take a look at digital versus film photography. Now, when it comes to the rise in sort of digital photography, it, the idea of between film and digital. This really began really close to almost 100 years ago. But in the 1990s, in 1990 specifically, there was a war waging in terms of photography. And there, there was a bit of an acceptance process for a lot of people to move away from film photography and actually go towards, say, the idea of digital photography. And then, of course, nowadays we've moved over to things like smartphones. So let's take a look at it. So in 1990, the first truly digital recording camera was available to the public and it came out. So let me take you into that. <clears throat> in 1990, way before we, you know, before that we had all sorts of film photography cameras. And these are just some of the examples that you can just search for when you go to Google and you just search for film photography cameras and you'll find a whole host of film photography cameras. But in 1990, what happened was Logitech, yes, funny enough, a computer manufacturer, as in like a device manufacturer in Switzerland, actually created the first digital camera. It was the Logitech Photo Main or Photo Man, I should say, digital camera. And it was actually created by Dicam Incorporated, specifically distributed by Logitech. And this was the first time we ever got to see a digital camera. It was a monochrome camera. Uh, it was the first time ever. Can you imagine? They only had a 320 by 240 resolution. I mean, that's crazy. And then later on, they had a 376 by 284 resolution. Today, we have thousands compared to that. We have like 7,000, 8,000 multiplied by. You know, it's, it, we're talking huge resolution. And it was a one meg internal RAM. <laughs> Fixed focus length. <clears throat> All right, so it was a 4.5 lens. It was a prime lens, but a 4.5, right? F4.5. You can understand, like I said to you, it's quite a quite a small hole. It doesn't bring up enough light, but hey, that was the first digital camera that ever came out. Here's a little serial number for it. <clears throat> and it was really quite a remarkable thing. And it took 12, uh, all the way to 32 images. And it was really essentially... It went on sale first, but actually, the, the funny thing about this camera is it was a little bit uh, sort of second to the post because Fujifilm was the first company to create a digital camera in 1988, okay? But it was never commercially available. It was actually just a trial system. It was something that they put together and they never really launched it. I think if Fujifilm had launched that, that would have been probably a pretty powerful leader today. Although Fujifilm has come back with other cameras. So quite an impressive camera. And the price at the time in 1990 was £4,099. That's, you know, for those days, it's a huge amount of money. 
all right? Then what happened was in 1992, Kodak, of course, Kodak being very famous in the film industry, uh, in terms of actual film for film cameras, they came out with this wonderful contraption, the DCS-200, which had a built-in hard drive at the time, right? Making it the unit really quite a decent unit, but it was a big device and it was bigger than sort of standard film cameras at the time. And it had a 1.2 megapixel resolution. So this was a massive improvement over something like this. And considering it had a 1.2 megapixel on it, it was remarkably designed. And here's an example of the Kodak DCS 200 from 1992. And it was an incredible piece of hardware. Had a 24 to 120 possible millimeter that you can put on a Nikon. So you could stick the Nikon camera underneath it, which is really quite cool. And then the idea was that you could actually have this little DCS actually comparing against it. So for example, this little Nikon camera, which was pretty impressive as a device, you could have that Kodak DCS 200 attached to those cameras and then actually have a, DC, a digital camera, which is rather crazy. So you could take a Nikon camera and convert it to like a digital camera, which is impressive. And um, then of course, it was the DCS 315, which is 1998 and it's sort of upgraded to become almost what we call a unibody today. It was an impressive piece of kit, absolutely impressive. And it was a massive hit, but of course you can understand that being that level, that was a very expensive camera at the time, you know, 1,524 by 1012 sort of pixels. That was a revolutionary thing. And um, yeah, it was just an incredible piece of work. So you can search more of those. If you look around, you can actually get to see. Here's an example of the Kodak DC200, which is quite an impressive piece of hardware. And uh, here's a little breakdown inside a Digicam museum in Germany. So it just shows you sort of the DCS 200 CI in this case, which is pretty much an updated version. And it was the beginning stages of the true, true digital cameras, okay, that we kind of see today. It was an impressive piece of work. It had a cable going out into a, a battery. <laughs> I love the days of <laughs> 1992 where they quantum batteries, you know. It's brilliant marketing and uh, it was a phenomenal piece of work absolutely phenomenal piece of design and I remember using it I remember truly using it and uh, my mom had one of these she was a major photographer at her time and uh, it, was, it was quite remarkable she didn't like digital photography she preferred film but I was quite curious about this so I got my hands on it and it was yeah, it wasn't it wasn't very very cheap to get my hands on it I, I didn't buy it obviously I just basically borrowed it for a few days but it was oh, it's impressive and i'll never forget it because that's like, that was like my first camera in my hands so that's a long time ago even at a spirit level and all kinds of stuff in the back and it had the basic details of telling you iso 50 100 200 400 which is incredible and uh, it had a little port as well that you can connect to um, different systems and consoles and stuff and even computers at the time but it was a beautiful piece of work absolutely stunning so you could attach that to this Nikon camera and then the actual Nikon would take the the shot so it would alleviate the issue of film which was brilliant absolutely brilliant and uh yeah it was something else to see I mean truly the remarkable beginnings of what we call a unibody today and uh I think a lot of what Canon did for the rest of the years was really modeled around something like this and uh, yeah, it was just incredible. And we had the sort of Hitchhiker 160 device, which was allowing us to, to, to communicate with the camera. And that it was brilliant put together, absolutely brilliant. And um, it was released at Macworld Boston. Macworld was a very famous computer show for many years and uh, still my favorite shows. I've been to one of them. Uh, I traveled all the way from Southern Africa to go there. And it was at the time when the they had the DC 100, the DC 200, DCS 200. They had the Nikon N 800. Oh, there's the Nikon F3 was released at the time. And that was when I got my hands on the first Nikon camera that I ever used. So that was pretty cool as well. And uh, yeah, what a, what a great, great time that was. And of course, you can see in this little digital camera museum, we'll, we'll dig a bit further into this website afterwards. Now, in 2006, 
the the massive change was where everything sort of exceeded film photography because you got to understand film photography continued on right through all the way to 2006 and a little bit further than that when it came to dominating okay but the dominance was overtaken and digital cameras exceeded those of film cameras around 2006 and that's when we started to see cameras coming out like point and shoot cameras and a really really impressive little point and shoot which of course we don't see that much anymore but actually effectively what's happened is the natural market progression has taken all the point and shoot camera capabilities and has put it into your smartphone today so technically you still have a point and shoot camera it's just inside a phone right so and that was thanks to Apple releasing the Apple iPhone, which was, I think, the first revolution when it came to putting cameras inside a phone, which truly brought back the point and shoot camera, which was phenomenal because now you could take a camera and carry it with you wherever you are. So there's a lot of sort of changes around 2006, which really started to overtake the market when it came to digital photography dominating film photography. Now, film photography has not gone away. Okay, it's pretty prominent and in fact it's making a massive comeback today in 2024 and upwards and looking at today's sort of um sort of market this is the kind of stuff we're getting to see today in terms of digital cameras they are pretty impressive uh and stunningly designed there's so many digital cameras out there you, you know as a consumer you are very lucky to to have your hands on digital cameras because i mean look at these things these things are like old style film photography cameras and yet there are digital cameras at 60 megapixels not 1.3 which was in 1992 this is 60 megapixels and it's not even a medium format camera you know and then you've got the crazy sort of cameras like you know nikon z8s and really impressive sort of cameras that can do incredibly fast shooting and also 45 megapixels which is insanity right so you know you, you you as a consumer we are very very lucky today all right let's come back to the the, the sort of changes so in 2024 what's happened is the global sort of digital photography market reveals that at the moment the industry is actually experiencing a substantial growth uh, you know contrary to what people think the photography industry is not dead Okay, a lot of people think that it's, oh, it's mostly video and all that, but actually, no, there's a natural growth what's happening right now. And that is uh, people are coming back to photography. They're starting to realize that actually digital photography is definitely uh, very, very useful, especially with social media. And it does, it, it's a, com a combination with that and videography. So a lot of people are becoming hybrid shooters. So you're looking at a massive growth at the moment of, 24.1 billion when it comes to a total market uh, and it's just going to grow and of course as cameras start to develop more sort of hybrid type of solutions like Fujifilm does hybrid very well like exceptionally well probably my ultimate favorite hybrid cameras are Fuji X the X cameras so the X-T3s X-T4s X-T5s they're phenomenal hybrids in terms of Nikon the Nikon Z's uh, the Z8, Z63, uh, it, it's it, they're just incredible hybrid cameras. And when it comes to uh, things like Canon, you're looking at, you know, typically the R5s, in this case, the Canon R5 II, the new one that's really released. I mean, these things are beautiful hybrid cameras. They can do both digital stills and they can do incredible video. So today's market is not dying. It's actually growing and it's growing considerably faster because video complemented with digital photography itself works exceptionally well when it comes to marketing, sales, products, all kinds of advertising. So it's not going to go away. But does that mean that film photography is dead? Absolutely not. Okay. And I'll, t I'll, I'll show you why. So <clears throat> in terms of sort of the early, early digital cameras, you know, they were very early to them to the market. And in 1992 it was a pretty big deal. And, you know, Kodak really 
where they where they went wrong is they considerably co co concentrate on, on sort of film photography and creating film. What they didn't do very well is actually progress forward with the hardware and really build into Kodak hardware. Because if they had done that, they would have been a dominating force today. They would have never allowed companies like Canon and Icon to take over the market. And uh, yeah, that's what's happened. But Kodak's not gone. They're back. They're coming back and they're coming back in full swing. They've got just all kinds of stuff film is coming back to film photography they've got digital cameras they're busy building it's really quite an impressive company considering they went into collapse so and and, and really it's quite a quite a change in the market that i've seen it's becoming very retro to use sort of film photography and go back into kodak system so pretty cool to me now when it comes to the advancements Okay, so with the advancements of sort of digital camera technology, we've seen that we've moved over to things, you know, from film, essentially, actual film that you used to put into cameras and take your roll of shots and then take it back into the labs and get them developed. And we've gone into sort of significant changes today with digital cameras because the idea is we went from sort of small memory cards with enough memory to sort of record uh, sort of digital photos to now going into the full length video recording and pretty impressive sort of megapixels and the advantage where we started to see digital cameras coming into play was the slow ISO you know even slowing down the ISO to down so we looked at um you know in, in the past we had things like ISO 50 right so it was a great way of having very little noise in the photographs but now we can reach ISOs to the level where it goes way beyond film photography and the resolution is incredible because of the capabilities of just the sensors that we have in the cameras and just the abilities we can you know most cameras today are minimum sort of 16 megapixels and upwards and then for those of you who are concerned about sort of 16 megapixels you shouldn't be because you could blow up a 12 megapixel image and create an a0 poster quite easily you know a0 is pretty big so it, it, it's nothing nothing to scoff if you want to create banners and big banners and that you really don't need more than 16 megapixels but today we've got cameras that can do 16 24 megapixels 35 45 60 102 megapixels we're talking some serious stuff and of course a lot of the cameras now have got things like memory cards that we can do high capacity so we can store a lot of photographs in there alleviating the need to sort of having to only have 12 24 36 exposures possible in the film which is a massive advantage for digital photography which now means the cost is reduced considerably because you only need to keep the photos you want to keep and then if you want to print you print the ones you want where and you can afford to take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs without having to worry about paying a lot of money for film because you just pay for your memory card once and then you're done so memory cards are really quite an impressive sort of technology and it was a, a very much a tandem type of technology that worked very closely with the photography industry and really pushed the market and then from those memory cards in terms of photography it pushed into the computer market and it became SD cards and then slowly USB sticks and then eventually solid state drives. So actually, funny enough, the photography market, the digital photography market drove the IT world in terms of internal storage. And then that's why today you have internal solid state drives all because it began from the NAND drives and it began from the small memory cards in the digital photography era. So it's quite interesting how that particular sector has influenced the IT sector, which is incredible. And uh, today we can do major sort of resolutions and, and pretty modern cameras can exceed sort of 24 megapixels. Like for example, my Leica Q3, which does, like I said, a 60 megapixels, 60. The Nikon, for example, Z8 in this case does a 45 megapixels. I have a Fujifilm GFX 100, two or 100 s2 which can do 102 megapixels and those are insanely cool so these are like the classic sort of medium format cameras medium format being well it's a different size sensor the size of that sensor that's inside that camera replicates the old medium format digital cameras that we used to use a long time ago which were insanely high quality images very tricky to mimic, mimic those, but Fujifilm has done a phenomenal job 
with their GFX camera lineup and Hasselblad as well with their particular medium format lineup, which actually the sensors are bigger than the Fuji film, but the difference is you paying almost triple the amount of money for the Hasselblad in comparison, say, to Fujifilm. And in all honesty, I've used both cameras and I mean, I honestly do prefer the Fujifilm. I, I love the Hasselblad medium format interface and the design of the cameras and just the capabilities of what it does. But overall, the usage of those cameras is nowhere near the Fujifilm, especially when it comes to hybrid digital photography, medium format and video, which is what GFX really excels in compared to say Hasselblad. So I think, you know, when it comes to actually overtaking film photography, we've done it. And it, it, it's been a long time coming because these cameras can do video photography, huge megapixels, a lot of storage in terms of S solid state drives, in terms of some cameras have SSDs built in, like for example, the Hasselbloods have solid state drives built in. And then so slowly as time goes on, you're going to start to see more cameras starting to build this in. And then on top of that, we have <clears throat> high capacity uh, SD cards and express card slots. So for example, in my, I will open up my little, I'll just excuse my microphone over here. I'll open up my little door over here and I'll take out a little memory card that I have. And in this case, I've got a little 256 gigabyte card just for my uh, Leica Q3, which is not very big, okay? But when it comes to actual card slots and different cards that are available, in my Nikon, okay, so I've got my little Nikon, little flap open over here so you can get to see my cards, and I'm gonna take out the Nikon cards, and this is a, a one terabyte SD card, okay? And of course, we've progressed over those of you brand new in photography to things like express cards again i'm using a one terabyte express card so these are much faster more throughput more reliable unbelievable amount of photographs and i can pull off in this for example when i turn this camera on let's see i have the ability to shoot yep yeah. that is At 45 megapixels, I can shoot well over 23, 24,000 photographs. That's huge. And when it comes to video, as soon as I pop it over to video, I can do 8K RAW, 8K RAW for a full 48 minutes and 27 seconds without anything going wrong. And then the card fills up. So it's just an incredible capability of cameras today that we have considering where we've come from absolutely pretty impressive now the large format film that's really interesting is that still relevant absolutely you saw that we've got the fuji films the hustle bloods and so on professional photographers that really opt to use film can use very large format uh, cameras and they really are pretty impressive cameras but they can reach resolutions to 400 megapixels and that's where film photography today surpasses digital photography at the moment because when you're looking at large Ford format large form format and, and sort of medium form format in still photography the actual quality of those photographs is unbelievably superior when it comes to film, but it has to be at the large format and medium format. Medium format now is being challenged because of Fuji and Hasselblad. So that's sort of moving slightly away from the film photography, but it's still only at the 100 megapixel mark. It's nowhere near the 400 megapixel mark. And um, really, when it comes to 35 millimeter film, when it comes to digital, you would typically pick up uh, those cameras everywhere really today, but they, they're not able to compete against a decent sort of digital camera today when it comes to film, unless they are typically something like a large format or large film format, like a 400 megapixels or something like that. So yes, in most cases, digital will surpass 
film cameras, but when it comes to the large formats, there's still a bit of a waging war at the moment. And it won't be long. If Fujifilm and Hasselblad can reach 100 megapixels or 102 megapixels within 18 months, then they can definitely do this 400 megapixels within the next three years. So it could be really interesting in the future. So what are the advantages really of digital photography compared to film? Well, the idea is that we're going to get instant gratification. Right. The, the, the fact that we don't have to sit, take the photographs, think about, oh, did we get them in focus? Are they okay? Did we take the right composition? We can't check the photographs easily because once a film is taken, it's taken. You can't see the photograph. You can't expose it. You're going to take it into a lab in a dark room with red light and then be able to expose it with the right chemicals. So the advantage with digital photography is it's instant gratification. You get to see exactly what you're doing with your photographs. And you will have a lot more photographs to work with. So you're going to get a lot more uh, sort of options available to you. Then the other thing that's very big is it's still till today, very cost effective for digital photography. Obviously, I mean, film still costs money. You'll pay near the price of say two different films that you might not buy. You'll probably pay for the entire SD card uh, when it comes to like a 128 gig SD card for cameras and that'll be like two rolls of film so it's pretty crazy that well it's definitely cost effective in digital and that's the biggest driver the biggest driver wasn't just the instant gratification it was the cost the cost was a massive hit it's one of the reasons what killed kodak is the fact that digital photography took over and really at the end of the day there was no films being purchased since and, and fuji film did the same thing they used to make film but then they stopped making film but they got a bit clever they took all the technology that they learned and they put all the fuji film capabilities into their lookup tables their LUTs that we use in things like video and they put it into the jpeg capabilities in terms of looks when it comes to fuji film so actually and even the raw files. You can actually process and develop your digital files using the Fujifilm looks. And that's huge. That's why Fujifilm till today outperforms Canon and Nikon when it comes to colors. It truly is an unbelievable set of cameras. Canon and Nikon get very close. And of course, we can always apply those looks to them anyway, those types of photos. Then, of course, the business practicality, it's obviously going to be better in digital because what really pushed the digital market was the point and shoot. This is what really changed everything. In terms of the photography, it was the point and shoot. That was the biggest, I would say, nail in the coffin when it comes to film because all of a sudden people could carry a little camera with them, take it on holiday, do their photographs and job done. And still people use them today. I, I still have a digital camera today as a point of shoot that I just take with me because I don't like necessarily using my phones. And uh, because of the ability of the zooms, the really capable zooms, Sony is particularly good at this still today. They've got incredible point and shoot cameras and uh, you know, the RX ones and the ZVE ones and ZV tens, and but they're so good at video as well. So there's some really cool sort of advancements happening today coming back and bringing back the point and shoot. So there's a lot of advantages in digital photography. So why is it important to do things like photography? And why is it also important to deal with things like, should you do printing? Should you have printing? Well, sadly, the digital era has had an adverse effect and that is well because of the digital environment and also the square format that we started to use in things like social media it's very relentless in terms of posting images online using your mobile devices and really the meaning of photography has been muddled it truly has been muddled and blurred against a month of chaos and flurry of imaging so really till, till today the sad part is that a lot of people don't really take photographs and really appreciate them the same way because it is nothing better than holding a photograph in your hand. It truly is an unbelievable feeling when you have something tangible in your hands. Now you might say, well, it's on the phone or it's in my tablet, it's on my TV and I can watch it. That's not really tangible. It's great. It's wonderful to see, but you don't really truly see the remarkableness of a photograph until you print, especially when you want to give a gift to somebody. You're not going to take photos and put on a phone and give the phone to somebody as a gift. 
you want to take those photos, do the print of them and take that print and give it to somebody. Because when someone receives a print of a photograph, it's truly an incredible thing. Let me explain to you. What do I mean by tangible memory? Here's a photograph that I took of my view that's outside my place where I live in Wales, in South Wales, in the UK. And this was a photograph that was taken during blue hour at sunset time. I live in a city called Barry, or town I should say, because it's very small. And you cannot really appreciate a digital photograph, apart from the fact that you can zoom in and out, of, depending on how good the quality of the, the picture is, but you can't appreciate photographs unless you begin to print them. And this is the kind of view that came out. And it's a stunning piece of work and it's frozen forever in time. Of course, this was a print that I did and I can print on my, my Canon P1000 printer, which does A2 prints. And uh, it's just an incredible feeling to have something tangible because it's a long lasting memory and enjoyment of what I've taken. And I, maybe I'll never see that particular sunset again. And that's a one off in a lifetime chance. Of course, we can go far beyond that. And one of my favorite photographs that I've ever taken, which actually won me quite a few awards. And uh, I've actually sold this photo quite a few times. And I'm really proud of this because many people can take photographs of celestial things like the skies, the moon and so on. And it's very tricky to even get the right shots of the moon, especially when you at a beginner level. And it took me approximately learning how to do moon photography around three to 4,000 photographs for many, many, many years. And every year I plan a particular time of the year because I know the right time of the year where the moon is the closest to the world, to the earth. It's got the best possible least amount of pollution in the sky. It's very nice and cold in the evenings. And I can really grab the most ultimate shots, even with basic lenses like my uh, little 500 and 600 millimeter lens that I have there. And uh, or even with something like a Leica Q3, which has a 60 megapixels, because then once I crop into 90, I can pretty much get a decent shot. But I like a 600 millimeter. That means I can get really close. And when you have photographs that print and then you see them on your wall, they're unbelievable. This is a result that I have of one of my photos that I've taken. Now, I know I'm, I'm apologies for the light that's above me here, but you cannot really appreciate a photograph until you actually see something like this in print. It is an unbelievable thing to see when printed and uh, just the fact of the quality of the print. You can actually see this on my website. If you go to obphoto.com, you can actually see the shot. And I've actually got full blown, full moon shots at the moment on my website, which are pretty impressive. And uh, you can't really beat those kind of photos. It's, you know, when you, when you have them digital, that's one thing, right? When you have them in print, it's a considerably different thing altogether. And what can I say when it comes to having a, a printout of the image, you're going to get a far better result because you're going to appreciate the photo photography you've taken and you're going to get to see, funny enough, all your mistakes, which is really quite important for you, especially if you want to improve on your photography. So here's my little website over here, obphoto.com. So you can always go to that. You can just open up the obphoto.com website over there. And essentially, when you go to the portfolios and click on Celestial over here, you're going to get to see the latest photos that I've taken. So this is the shot that I've taken recently, which I haven't printed yet, which I'm about to. I just need to get more ink for my printer. And this is a full blown shot of the moon that I've taken. So pulling something like this off with film photography would be impossible. With digital photography, this kind of photograph being a full moon, it's an incredible shot. I'm not even zoomed in yet. If I zoom in, you can get to see all the different shots that I've taken over time. So this is four shots. This is the one you just saw in print. So this is the print one shot. This is the printed out photo. Okay. This is the actual printed out photo. And uh, I was quite proud of that. That happened in 2017 in September. 
it was in Bedford in the UK, it was the perfect time to go shooting, uh, that happened in 2018, this was in uh, last year I think if I'm not mistaken and so on, so every sort of year I go and I take these shots where I can truly see the remarkable sort of beauty, beauty of the moon and um, the idea of this is that you can't really truly appreciate something like a photograph of that kind of capable uh, caliber that kind of beauty if you don't print and put on your wall i mean no offense to anybody who's a digital photographer and you don't really like printing but this is the ultimate way to truly see a photograph to see the quality of your prints and actually see them on the wall okay they are an unbelievable way of showing and, and, and showing yourself, well, look, look what you've done. So it's a true appreciation. So it's very tangible. It's long lasting and enjoyment because it's constantly on my wall and it's a true appreciation of your own photography. So learn to print your, your photographs. You don't have to print all of them, but learn to print them. You'll be surprised. And actually, this is what I do for a lot of my subscribers on YouTube. On occasion, what happens is I will have a person joining and they will be sort of randomly selected and I'll just send them a print for free. And I will be doing an entire project on this where I will have a subscription process in my account on YouTube. And that'll just be any additional support that people will want to support my channel with if they wish to do so. But those particular Patreons or subscribers will have a free print every month from me so it really depends on which tier they're going to choose but then you won't have to pay for prints like this and it'll just be all the photography that i do you'll just get wonderful prints they'll go up to a2 size and you know that's something that i'm hoping to do and i won't be charging for the prints i'll just be because they're subscribing to my channel on a monthly basis they deserve to have a print you know and they deserve to have it for free so and i want to really bring my prints into the market because that's the only way I can truly appreciate my photography. Okay. Now, when it comes to looking ahead and what we're going to do in the next sort of module uh, in this course, in the next topic of this course, we're going to take a look at some useful tips to get the most out of your photography with the, mo the topic called camera and equipment tips. So that's what we're going to be doing next. We're going to take a look at the different types of gear that you can use and the types of sort of interesting accessories and so on that are that you could probably have inside your kit so that you can really enhance your photography and take it to the next level otherwise that's it for this particular video i wanted to thank everybody for watching all my subscribers my my utmost appreciation i can't believe i've reached 4800 subscribers already which is mind-blowing and uh to everybody who's new to my channel thank you for watching anybody who's interested and wants to uh, subscribe as a subscriber just click on that little link at the top it basically activates the the that you're a subscriber and it basically says oh, if i bring out a new video it'll tell you and it just gives the algorithm the chance to send my video to new people that's it really those of you who are interested in going further in the subscription model and supporting me further even with patreon and all that the details will be inside the actual description of the video but i don't expect anybody to necessarily do that extra support it just helps me fund any new projects but that can take time i'm not worried i've only just began the process of uh, being eligible to be monetized so it will take time i'm not worried about that i want to produce good content for people especially in this case this is a little mini course i'm putting together for 10 topics this is a second topic today and it's for beginners just to get them into the roadmap of photography and to help them on their way. Thank you everyone for your time. This is once again Demetrius here again from OB Pixel and today it's for my brand obphoto.com. You can see the details in the description and also you're more than welcome to download the PDF. It's for free. I'm not going to ask for details, contact information, any of that stuff. You just click the link and download this PDF just to give you a little bit of insight if you're interested. Otherwise, thank you and I'm signing out.